The Lord be with you. We welcome you this evening as we gather for what would be our second Wednesday, but last Wednesday the weather wasn't so agreeable, so it's our first Wednesday together. And that will affect our schedule in terms of the texts that we're going to be studying, and I'll explain that in just a minute, but otherwise normal times. So uh, during our season of Lent on our Wednesday services, our series here at Zion, they have a different series at Trinity, and you're obviously welcome to go to either one. They're studying the challenge of forgiveness, or the forgiveness challenge, a very worthy topic. We are studying Psalms, so the uh, poetry, prayer, and the Psalms. So we're looking at now will be five different Psalms, and we're going to study them as both poetry and as prayer. And how we can use these in our prayer life, how they can guide our prayers and, and move us in prayer. So you should have, if you didn't get one, I have enough cards, one per family group. So we may have a few extras afterwards if you want to take some home. But we'll refer to that during the message briefly, but it's really designed for you to take home as a visual presentation of the psalm with some brief commentary and brief reflections on the psalm. My encouragement for you is to take that home and sometime during the week, spend 10 minutes just reflecting upon the material on that card. So I put that together specifically for this series and I encourage you to take some time to read over that. Okay, you're going to notice, uh, maybe you won't, which is just fine if you don't, but we have switched to a new, well, I should back this up. Because of your generous giving, we were able to afford to replace our projection computer, which I think was close to 10 years old now, and was starting to give us some issues, just basically saying, no, I'm not going to work today. And that's not always the most uh, friendly thing to have on a Sunday morning when it just says, no, not today. And so we've updated that. Now, when we updated that, that meant the presentation software that we were using was no longer compatible with the new computer. You understand how that goes. So this is a new presentation software. This is the first time we've used it. So if there are a few glitches or if things aren't quite like you're used to, be patient with us while we get it all figured out and get the kinks worked out. It may be a few weeks where we get it all worked out, but uh, we are confident that we'll get it worked out and it'll be, it'll be wonderful. We're very appreciative that you are uh, such generous givers so we can do that because as you know, technology needs to be updated from time to time. Okay, one other item just to share with you. I mentioned this on Sunday. Uh, I think I have a, a text scheduled to go out and an email that you probably would have received already. There is a webinar happening tomorrow at 11 a.m. I know for most of us that's not a convenient time, but if you would like to watch the webinar here at the church, I'm going to plug the laptop into the TV out there. It's a webinar on church and culture, equipping the parents in your congregation with a biblical view of gender. Kind of a big deal, right? Kind of a big topic today. Now, from what I understand, Alliance Defending Freedom, who is the one hosting this, and they're a partner organization with our Synod, they, they've said they're going to make a video recording of this. So once we have that, I also will share that with you. For those of you who aren't able to watch live, you can watch it on your own time. But if you'd like to come out to the church to watch at 11, you can do that. Otherwise, you should have received in your email and in a text the link that you need to watch it live. If you didn't, let me know. I'll be happy to text that to you or email it. But that's a neat opportunity tomorrow. I encourage you to take a look at that. And the one other thing I want to point out is this will be, a, well, two things. This will be a little different in terms of how we're going to read the Psalms during our series. When you've been reading through the Psalms in Scripture, sometimes you're going to see at the top of the page, for the choir master or with stringed instruments, or they'll have some musical term. We don't even know what it means, but it's a musical term. The Psalms were, for the most part, designed to be sung. So, we're going to sing them during our midweek series. And it's just a simple chant. And I know some of you say, I don't like chanting. That's okay, you don't have to like it. But for this series, we are going to chant them so we get a feel of what it's like to sing the Psalms. That's the way they were designed to be used in worship, to be sung. And so we're going to do that during this series. It's a very simple chanting pattern. Don't be intimidated by it. But we're not going to chant every single week, but just during the Wednesdays, we'll chant the Psalms. And we have a, our confirmation readers, a student and a child, will be reading over the next five Wednesdays. Tonight we have the Gore family who will be coming forward when I invite them forward in just a moment. Okay, so that covers my announcements. 
Uh, let me see. We're ready to turn to our first song. <laughs> May remain seated. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gore family, we invite you forward at this time. Uh, they will be sharing a responsive reading, the opening verses, and so they'll read uh, their part, and your part is in bold. So we have Claire and Mike, and oh, Noah is coming, and Evelyn too. Claire is in our eighth grade, and so she will be confirmed in April. So go ahead. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord. Let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you. For you will answer me. Hide your face from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with the will because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God 
God who is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forward. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Thank you, Gore family. Thank you. You can just put it on the, the lectern there, be perfect. During Lent, our, our midweek series, we also have the opportunity to review different sections of the large catechism. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be reviewing uh, the Lord's Prayer. And so we will, I will speak the uh, Our Father who art in heaven, then I'll ask what does this mean, and then on the screen you'll see the response. Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. One item before we get to our psalm here. The really neat thing about the Lord's Prayer, there are lots of neat things, but if you've ever felt lonely or alone, or abandoned. The Lord's Prayer reminds you in its very first word that you belong to a people, to a body, because the very first word is our Father. So even if you pray it alone, it is meant to remind you that you are not alone, because you belong to the fellowship of the baptized. So. The prayer, then, of the Lord's Prayer can be prayed like we often do, just word for word straight through. But it can also be prayed in the petitions, simply praying, Our Father who art in heaven, and then meditating on that petition in your prayer. So using it as a springboard into your prayer. And we'll see that as we go through the Lord's Prayer throughout this series. As Luther reflects upon it, these are ways that we can use the prayer to guide our prayers. Now, we're going to chant our psalms. Go ahead and put that back up there. I will chant the first section, and you see yours in uh, bold. You'll simply echo me. So if you listen to what I do, I'll be chanting a cappella, and the organist will come in to accompany you when you sing. So she'll give me my opening notes, and then we'll begin. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lift up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Our next reading is from our gospel text. And what we'll be doing over the next five weeks is reading continuously through the account of the Passion from Matthew's Gospel. So these will be a little bit longer sections of text, so I'll let you remain seated during that. But over the next five weeks, we will cover the entire narration of the crucifixion and death of Jesus. So we begin in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, beginning with verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. 
But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Here ends our text. Kids, I invite you to come forward for a minute. We'll have a brief time together. Come on up. to get yourself extracted from the pew. So come on up here and find a seat. Welcome, welcome. Good evening. Good to see you. Good evening. Okay, so this evening, we're going to be, you can sit up here, we're going to be talking about a psalm. There's a book in the Bible called the Psalms. It has 150 psalms. But what is a psalm? We don't walk around using that word very often. Maybe it'd be helpful to talk about it like this. There's a book in the Bible with 150 prayers. And there are different kinds of prayers. Some of them are very happy prayers. So prayers where we say, thank you God for giving us this amazing thing. And there are some prayers that are very sad prayers because something in our world is not right. And so we're going to see different kinds of prayers that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. But remember, the, the cool part I want to share with you is sometimes it's hard for us to know how to pray. And one of the gifts that God gives to us, he gives us a whole book in his Bible full of prayers that we can use to pray. So we talked about this in confirmation today. But when we learn to talk, when we're babies and we grow up, we learn to talk by hearing our parents and older adults in our life and older kids speak those words to us. And then we speak those words back to them because we learned them from them. 
That's how we learn to pray. God actually speaks his word to us first. And he puts the words in our mouth, and we learn to speak those words back to him. So part of that's when we come to church and we hear the Bible read, we're learning God's word. And then the Psalms are prayers where they've heard God's word and they've put it into a prayer. So I want you to pay attention when we're talking about our psalm for tonight. It's a prayer and it's God's gift to us. He gave us the words and we can take those words and offer them back to him. And we know when we bring his words back to him, he's going to hear those words and he will answer us. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You watch the screen, you'll see pictures and so forth to help make sense of it. And listen for our prayer, our psalm tonight. All right, thank you for being good listeners. You can head back to your seats and we'll continue with our next song. Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, let me just say a quick word about that hymn. 
there's some pretty deep and profound lyrics in that hymn. And that hymn you just sang was over 750 years old. Kind of cool to think about. Been in the church for a long time. Now, for the next five Wednesdays we have together, we're going to study the Psalms of Scripture. So you can see the title on the screen, Poetry, Prayer, and the Psalms. So we're going to take one psalm on each Wednesday and pause to appreciate both the poetry of the psalm and the way it helps us to pray. In order to help you continue the study at home, I designed the cards that you should have received uh, that you uh, can take home with you and use for personal devotion. So I encourage you to take some time during the week to read on it and to reflect on it. Tonight, as you can see on the card, we're, and on the screen, we're studying Psalm 13. Before we dive in, though, let's first orient ourselves to the Psalms. The Psalms function as the prayer book of God's people. As such, they cover a great variety of subjects and concerns, more than we have time to address right now or even in our five weeks together. To make things very simple, we'll divide the Psalms into two major types, lament and praise. So lament psalms struggle with the not-rightness of the world. They wrestle with some form of injustice or tragedy or loss, something that is wrong with the world. And they implore God to act. The praise psalms celebrate what's right and good in the world. They retell the story of God's saving deeds and thank him for his kindness and goodness. If you read the Psalms, you'll notice that they don't read like the Gospels or like the Book of Kings or Judges. That's because the Psalms are poetry. And you can see that in the way your English Bible presents the Psalms, just the way they're formatted. So they don't have words going from column to column, but they're printed in such a way as to help you see the parallel thought lines that characterize Hebrew poetry. So think of these as couplets. These are ideas that the author has linked together in his mind and for, for you to link together in your mind. These ideas are meant to complement one another or to provide contrasting ideas. But they are meant to be conceptually linked together. So for these authors, poetry wasn't about rhythm and rhyme like it is for us but it was about conceptually linking ideas, about painting pictures with conceptually linked words. If you read through the Psalms, you will see that they are broken into five books. So when the Psalms were gathered into the collection that we call the Psalms, the editors grouped them into these five books. Now, that's very suggestive. It's a suggestive grouping because it immediately brings to mind the five books of the Torah. And this connection is strengthened by the first two books of the entire collection, which biblical scholars have recognized as introductory to the whole collection. So Psalm 1 extols the man who meditates on the Torah, on the teaching of God. So this teaches us to see the Psalms as this invitation through prayer to meditate on the teaching of God. So we're taking the teaching and we're letting it direct our prayer. And Psalm 2 reflects on this great promise that God made to King David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 of a messianic king in the Davidic line. And it concludes with these words, blessed are all who take refuge in him, in the Davidic king. And this teaches us that as we're meditating on the teaching of God through prayer, that we are to be hoping and waiting for the future messianic king. And to make this a long story short, we see that messianic king in Jesus Christ. So we're able to see Jesus in the Psalms. And you will see that in the brief reflection on the back of your card because I've printed the thoughts there on the back of your card from Martin Luther. 
he shared thoughts on all the Psalms, and I've just excerpted some of those thoughts from a book that our church body put together called Reading the Psalms with Luther. So I just excerpted some of those thoughts, put them on the back of the card. So when Luther writes about the Psalms, he sees Jesus, and you'll see that come out in his reflections. Okay, lots more we could say about this, but we need to get to our psalm for tonight, Psalm 13. So if you take out the psalm card, if you want to follow along that way, and you might have to share or just take it home, look at it at home. And I know you can't read it on the screen, that's okay, I just want you to see the picture of it. But if you take it out, you will see my attempt to help us appreciate the poetic structure of the psalm through underlines and bold print. So I put those in there to try to help you visually. That's supposed to show you how the, the parallel thought structures are working. So Psalm 13 is a psalm of David, and it's clearly under the lament category of psalms, because David is meditating on the not-rightness of the world. Further, he's asking God to take action to help. So four times he repeats the words, how long? How long, O Lord? How long will things stay like this? How long will the wicked triumph? How long will I have to witness injustice? How long will it feel like trusting you is pointless? In his questions, David asks, Will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? So implicit in his question is the plea for God to remember and for God to see. For God to turn his face to David's plight, to our plight, because remember, the Psalms, they are, they are collected as a prayer, prayer book for us to guide us in our prayer and in our reflection on the teaching of God. So Psalm 13 isn't just a prayer in a book. It's your prayer and my prayer that we can bring to God in the midst of our dark night of the soul. So David has reflected deeply on the teaching of God, and he knows that remembering and seeing are preludes to God's acting. Okay? Remembering and seeing are preludes to God's acting. In other words, David has read his Bible and he knows that when God remembers and God sees, it means God's getting ready to act. These are acting words for God. So by asking God to remember and to see, David is asking God to act. So when we go to God in prayer, we can take the words of this psalm with us, with, which are a deep reflection on the teaching of God. We can take these words with us into our prayer as we ask God, Will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? Or we could phrase it in the indicative and say, Remember me, O Lord. Turn your face to me. See my situation and take action. That's what David's praying. David then turns his questions into a petition. Consider and answer me. And he prays, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now things are pretty dark for David. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you felt a burden beyond your ability to bear. A burden you felt like was going to crush you. A despair that's darkening your soul. David was there. And his prayer was twofold. First, light up my eyes. Right? He's basically praying, fill me with life and joy in you, Lord. And that's a prayer I know we can all pray. But David also knows that people are watching him. Is his faith for real? Is it legit? If he wavers, Will his enemies have cause to rejoice, even to gloat? So he desperately prays for God to lift up his eyes with faith and trust in him so that won't happen. And it's a beautiful prayer for us. Light up my eyes. Fill my eyes with the joy of your promises and love. 
Again, we can see how this prayer can guide and shape our prayers. And what David prays next is so deep and so meaningful. He confesses, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now, David knows his Bible. He's reflected on it deeply. He knows the weight of the word steadfast love. So when God called Moses up on Mount Sinai to give him the covenant, God came down on the mountain and passed before Moses as he passed by God. As he passed by, then God proclaims these words before Moses. The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So when David says that he has trusted in God's steadfast love, he's saying that he knows who God is. He knows the covenant that God made with his people. He's remembering the great salvation event of the Old Testament, Israel's redemption from Egypt. So David is teaching us how to remember God's steadfast love in our redemption event, in the cross and empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Because this is where God manifests his steadfast love for us. So no matter how dark things get in your life, God's steadfast love remains. Because God's work in Christ's cross and empty tomb, they remain. And nothing and no one can take that away from you. God's steadfast love endures for you. And then David says, My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And now the connection to Jesus gets even clearer. The Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves. And do you remember what the name of Jesus means? Remember what the angel said to Joseph? You should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. And any guesses what Hebrew word his name comes from? Yeshua. Here's what I'm saying. Reading our Bibles in a Christocentric, a Christ-centered way allows us to read it this way. My heart shall rejoice in your Jesus. My heart shall rejoice in your Jesus. So no matter our circumstances, no matter how dark, no matter how difficult, no matter how discouraging, we can say with David, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And friends, never forget this. Because he has dealt bountifully with you in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand. With joy and confidence we confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And be seated as we gather our offering, and kids, you can bring yours forward as well.
We stand to pray. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and drive from them all the snares of the enemy. Let your holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And let your blessing be on us always. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Eternal God, the hours both of day and night are yours. And to you the darkness is no threat. Be present, we pray, with those who labor in these hours of night, especially those who's, who watch and work on behalf of others. Grant them diligence in their watching, faithfulness in their service, courage in danger, and competence in emergencies. Help them to meet the needs of others with confidence and compassion. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us at the end of the day, at the end of our life, at the end of the world. Abide with us with your grace and goodness, with your holy word and sacrament, with your strength and blessing. Abide with us when the night of affliction and temptation comes upon us, the night of fear and despair the night when death draws near. Abide with us and with all the faithful, now and forever. Amen. We pray together. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you, defend you from all evil, and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. I invite you, before we turn to our last hymn, just to pray the table prayer with me as we'll make our way out to enjoy our supper. We pray together. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. We sing our final hymn.